Let's go, Christian. Let's go, Christian. Hey, man, we still fired up? Oh, yeah. That was the uh, super encouraging GNN. Yes. And uh, great job, AV team, setting up this incredible screen right here. But uh, uh, amen, family. Well, the Sunday after Easter, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, Easter is sort of the Super Bowl of uh, church services. And last day, last week didn't disappoint, for sure. I, I mean, we had uh, uh, over 80 people out here, and it was encouraging. And it's, so it's awesome to see the people who made it past Easter. Great to see you guys here. We made it through. But uh, uh, the day of Easter may have passed, but the message remains the same. Come on, bro. And, uh, uh, you know, Easter is all about the death, burial, and resurrection and that celebration of Jesus. And I want to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. But I don't want to talk about just about Jesus. I want to talk about us. Come on, bro. Amen. And in the same way Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected, that's exactly what Christianity is as well. You know, it's all about a new life. And that spiritually dying to ourselves, dying to our sinful natures, and being raised again to a new life right. in Christ. Let's turn here to Ephesians chapter 2. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll pick it up right here, verse 1. It says, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nation and following its desires and thus, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages... He might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And, you know, here's the thing. We all were, were, were once enslaved, shackled to our sin. But he said, you know what? Through Christ Jesus, through grace, through his grace, man, we, we have power over that sin. Now, now, sadly, a lot of the religious world has taken eight. Since God talks about grace here. We can continue to live shackled to our sin, having an understanding of grace, and for that to be enough. But uh, true followers of Jesus, an understanding of grace isn't enough. You know, Titus chapter 2, verse 12, it says, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Right. So a uh, true understanding of grace is going to produce true repentance in our lives. Oh, you know, the first step of truly connecting to grace is dying to our sinful nature. And my first point is death to an old life. Death to an old life. And the title of the lesson, and what I want to talk about in all, is being alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. Alive in Christ. First point, death to an old life. And the first, the first point of dying to an old life is dying to our sin, as we see here in Colossians chapter 2. Come on. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, When you are dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And this is the reality is that Easter is celebrated and rightfully so. It was a public spectacle of Jesus' victory over sin. 
And we have the opportunity to have that same victory, but uh, that, that same victory does not come when we acknowledge the victory of Jesus, right? The, the true victory comes when we come into contact with that public spectacle of Jesus on the cross, and that's in Romans chapter 6. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Jesus had his victory on the cross, but our victory comes after that, and that's in Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say that shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, we died to sin. How can we live it in any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. You know, and the, the scriptures teach is that our victory comes when we come to contact with the blood of Christ at our baptism. Come on, bro. At our baptism. You know, I, I got baptized just over almost five years ago. Come on, bro. And the, the, the older I get, as, as a disciple, the more appreciative I get, I am, of my baptism and of my salvation. You know, and it talks about Romans 6, man, we die to our sin. We, we, we die to our sinful nature. And, man, I, I look back and, man, where would five more years being shackled to my sinful nature have me today? I mean, where would I have any of us? Man, if you hadn't been baptized when you were. Had you come into contact with the blood of Christ, had your sins forgiven, had you come to a knowledge of the truth, amen. We, we've had victories, we've had struggles, but where would you be today? And I think to even where I got myself through 22 years of sin, you know, I was living in San Francisco. I moved there when I was 20 years old. And man, for the first time, I was out of my parents' house. And I thought, saw so that is as freedom. As freedom, I said, man, I am free. I, I am free to do whatever I want. You know, that there was no more guilt trip if I slept in for church. Uh, that there was no more curfew. There was, there was no more excuses. There was no more. There was, and I, I was free. I, I mean, I, I could call my parents if I wanted to. But, hey, if, if, if I didn't want to talk to them on a Sunday evening, they called me. I, I just didn't have to answer. If I was doing something else. And it, it, I, I just felt so free. I could do whatever I wanted. Wow. But after two years of that freedom, I felt more enslaved than I had ever felt before. Oh, you know, after two years of freedom, man, and not just, just, just freedom to do what I want. I was living with my brother. I had free rent. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I had free so I had family who worked in the, the, the Cal State system. So I had free tuition. And, and I was, I, man, I was, I was living, I was living rent free, I was living tuition free, and I, I felt like I had freedom over everything. When in reality, the, the only true freedom in my life was the freedom that Satan had in my mind and my heart. You know that, that, that as I got deeper and deeper into the world's freedom, I became more and more enslaved. And the more and more I indulged, the, the more and more I got drunk, the more and more I committed myself to, to, to cheating, to immorality, to, to, to drunkenness, the more and more I committed myself to all these different things, the more and more empty I felt. And then when I was 22 years old, from coming from a place where I felt like I was enslaved, living at home, I move out, I feel free for a year and a half, and then I just start to feel miserable. After, at 22 years old, I was reached out to by a disciple and sat down for, for, with, with a few, for, for the most part, pretty normal guys. I mean, you know, they, they weren't too impressed with any sense of the word. They were a lot shorter than me. I, I mean, I, they didn't really have anything in their lives that impressed me. They didn't drive nice cars, they, you know, and thank you, Dave, now for telling everybody I ever drive a Volvo. Uh, you know, but, but uh, there, there was nothing that, that, that particularly impressed me about these guys. But as we got deeper into the scriptures, 
They called me not just to a new life, but they called me to, to die to my sin. Did they call me to die to my sin? And when I made that decision to die to my sin, I got baptized in May 2016. And ever since then, God in an incredible way, the pinnacle being my incredible radio wife right here. But only when I made that decision to die did I have a chance to live. Let's turn here to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on, on things of earth, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, is your life, appears, then you also will, will appear with him in glory. Put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, yeah. which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. And, you know, right here in Colossians 3, says, hey, set your mind on things above. And, you know, I, I just got a haircut yesterday. You might notice he went a little short on the beard, but amen. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when you get a haircut, he says, hey, all right, put your head sometimes. So we'll, we'll t take out the little pad so I can lean my neck back on it. But sometimes when he doesn't want, want to, to waste that helmet, hey, just put your head back. I look up. And I trim, trim up the sides, trim up the beard. And when I first look up, when you first look up, it's like, all right. But then after about five, seven, ten seconds, 15 seconds, my, my, my neck starts to hurt. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it starts to ache. And I'm like, man, like, when are you going to be done? And he's like, D -d 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 -d. and I'm like, all right, give me one second. I put my head down. Right. Hey, I had some neck problem problems in fourth grade. They're still so lingering. I swear. I swear I'm not just a baby. But but and I, I put my neck down, man. And it's sort of the same thing. It comes when it comes to our spirituality. You get caught in the standard, you're like, amen. I'm gonna set my mind on things above. Woo! You're, you're fired up to get focused on God. And then after a couple of weeks, after a couple of maybe your neck starts to get sore. Uh, and you, you start to start to do what, what seems so it would fire you up to look at godly things, heavenly things. Now it's becoming more and more, uh, more and more enjoyable and a lot easier to focus on earthly things, to focus on relationships, to focus on your finances, to focus on your job, to focus on your school. And what months, weeks ago, months ago, years ago, used to fire you up, now it becomes a drag to start to look back up at those things. And this morning, you may be feeling that. You're, you, may, you may have a sore neck. You may be feeling, feeling the weight of your sin because Paul goes through a pretty expansive list of sins here, right? And I can just about promise you, what these, these touch about each and every one of our lives right he goes he has two lists he talks about the first one in verse five he talks about sexual immorality impurity lust evil desires greed which is idolatry and then he jumps down to verse to verse eight he talks about anger rage malice slander filthy language and this morning as each and every one of us looks through this passage I want you to identify one of these things. What, which one of these are holding you back? Is it greed? You know, Dave, you did a great job of setting our mind on things above in regards to our finances. But is it greed? Is it idolatry? You know, maybe, maybe it's impurity. Who, who knows what it is? But I, I believe that each and every one of us may be feeling a bit of what it talk, talks about in Lamentations chapter 1. And in Lamentations 1, I'm going to read it for you. 
Don't want to don't uh, waste five minutes here as we, we fiddle through our pages to find it. But in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 14 says, My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung on my neck. And the Lord has sapped my strength. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, Satan makes the, our sins look like our friends. Look like maybe a little bit of an outlet from discipleship. Maybe a little bit of an outlet from our godly life. I, I still, I'm going to live this godly life. But I, I, I need a little pit stop here with my sinful nature. Then, then, I, then I'll get back on the road. But the reality is we, we, we go to make that pit stop. And when we pull back onto the road, man, we, we, we have that sin and it's, it's yoked to us. And we feel like, you know what? I, I want to get fired up. I want to get in the battle. I want to make disciples. I want to live out my purpose. And that, that, that sin's holding us back. And before we know it, that, that sin that we, we used to sort of glance at now has, has a tangible place in our life. Where it's going from being a struggle once a month, once a, once a week, to man, now every single morning, every single night, what we're, we're thinking about, it, it's weighing on us. And we, we, we can start to not die to our sinful nature, we can start to die to our godly nature. And I want to challenge us and allow us to make a decision this morning that, you know, Easter Sunday and that, that victory that Jesus had on the cross, it didn't go away when we started to struggle. The, the, the victory is still there. We just got to make a decision. The awesome thing about Christianity is it doesn't how much how, matter how much money you have in your bank account. doesn't matter where your IQ is. doesn't matter where your address is. It's all a decision. It's all a decision to reconnect to the power of the cross. Because through the cross, we don't just have the victory to get out of one vice or get out of a situation. Through the cross, we have the power to overcome impurity. We have the, the, through the cross, we have the power to overcome our idolatry. Through the cross, we have the power to overcome our laziness, our sinful nature, and to be resurrected. No matter if you've been a disciple for a week, a month, if you're studying the Bible, through the power of the, the cross, we have the, we have the power to be resurrected to a new life in Christ Jesus. And that's the title of my second point, resurrected to a new life. And that's the reality is that when Christianity can, becomes just about the death, it, it can it can be a lot of a lot of uh, uh, just anxiety. It can become a lot of uh, pain, and it can just be a, be a lot of a lot of men just hitting our head against the wall and trying to trying to, to to not sin again every morning, every night. Just trying to man not sin, not sin, not sin. And when our Christianity is just not doing things, eventually your your, your strength is going to get sapped. Your motivation is going to get sapped, and you're you're just going to quit. And that's the reality is that when, when, when your Christianity is just, man, don't do this. Don't do this. It's being called to repentance, called to repentance, called to repentance. But we're not actually taking that repentance and actually going somewhere offensively. Eventually, we're going to fizz out, whether it's this month, next year, five years, ten years or not. Eventually, you're just going to get tired because Christianity is about the death, burial, and then resurrection to that new life. Right. And if you're just feeling dead, you may be, be feeling like, hey, well, I've been dying to my sin. I've, I've been denying myself. Hey, man, I want to call you to live that new life. Live that new life. Let's go here to John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, you know, this is after Jesus is saying, hey, hold to the teachings. Man, you, you gotta deny yourself. You gotta. Jesus gives some encouragement here. John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And have it to the full. So if you feel like your life's not full this morning, 
then, then you're missing out on the power of God. Because God wants to give you a life with more purpose, with more meaning, and allow you to have more impact 100 times than you would have had in the world. He, he doesn't want you to live just a life of self-denial. God wants you to live a life and live it to the full. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be successful in your endeavors. He wants you to have a cranking job. He wants you to have to get an incredible spouse. He wants you, man, he wants you to, to, to see your, your, your kids raise up and to become incredible men and women of God. He wants to see it. But we've got to want it as well. We've got to connect to that. Let's go look at somebody who connected, connected this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at Moses here. We're going to look at Moses here. And Moses, he's an interesting guy. We see here in verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his rewards. Wow. Right, so so Moses made the decision to die to his own life. He said, "You know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take the treasures. I'm not going to take the comforts of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter." And that was everything. Pharaoh Pharaoh was the most prominent, most powerful, most rich man in the world. Moses would have had everything he could have wanted for his whole life. He said, "You know what? I don't want it." He said, I'm turning it down, not because I just want to hate my life. No, 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 because I'm looking ahead. He said, this is a long-term investment. I'm giving up the treasures the world's going to give me now, not because I'm just a great person. No, 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 no. I'm just thinking long-term. I'm thinking long-term. He, he gave up his life of sin to grab on to his life for God. And not only did he let go of his life's of sin. He, he, he totally repented. It says that the, the, the scriptures tell us he became a shepherd. Moses went from, from growing up to, to eventually going to be the right hand of Pharaoh to be a shepherd. Now a shepherd in, in Genesis 46, Joseph tells his brothers when they come in with, with Jacob and they come in and then they come into to Egypt from from, uh, uh, from Israel. They say he said he says to them. He says, "Hey, tell Pharaoh that you are shepherds, because all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians." So in the world's eyes, Moses said, "Hey, you know what? I'm resigning from my place in the palace to be the lowliest of the low." He threw his life away. From a worldly perspective, can you imagine being an Egyptian and seeing, man, you see Moses, you know, going through town with his, you know, and his, uh, uh, and his chariots, and man, you see him up, up eating with Pharaoh at the dinner table, and man, you see him, and he's held in such high esteem, and then the next day, you see him out in the fields, he's a shepherd, say, is that, is that Moses? Man, what is he? <laughs> what is, what's that guy doing? <laughs> But, but the reality is, is that Moses followed in the, in the footsteps that God would lay out. Right. Because after Moses, we see Abraham. Yeah. Right? Or excuse me. After Moses, we see Jesus. Right. After, Moses, after Moses, we see Paul, right. who gave up man, the, the, the wealth and the prestige of being a prominent Pharisee, man, to being persecuted and killed for his faith. And after Moses, we see each and every one of us who may not have given up, man, being the right hand of Pharaoh, but man, each and every one of us gave something up to become a true disciple. And obviously, compared to Moses, man, what, what are we doing? Like, what do we have to, to complain about? 
But I think even back to, to my time when I became a disciple when I was 22, right after I became a disciple, uh, I had an internship with pg and right? So out there in the East Bay at Walnut Creek, I had an internship, and uh, it, it was awesome. You know, we, we shared a uh, we shared a, a, a quad with the Chevron World headquarters. We shared. I, I was working with people from Penn State, Notre Dame, Michigan State. People came from all over the country for this internship. You know, people driving Audis, people drive people driving Range Rovers to work. People drive man, people. The, what the world says, hey, get this. My family saying, hey, man. Get them in, man. Hold on, get your foot in there. Take that job. And one day, uh, the director of communications for the company came into our office, and there was an open computer next to me. So he sits down, we start talking, we connect. I lived in San Francisco, he lived in San Francisco. Uh, we set up, I was like, Yeah, you know, I'd love to pick your brain. Da, 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 da. I was like, Man, I'm gonna share my faith with this guy. I go out to dinner. So we go out to dinner. He's like, Man, you know what? You'd be great. I'd love to take you under my wing. Get you into an office here in San Francisco. I said, man, that's awesome. That's good. And so I, I go, I have a deep time with my disciple, with, with Quake. I'm like, bro, like, man, this is a uh, foot. He said I could be a spokesperson. He said I could, he said, man, he, he'd take me, he'd, he'd let me travel with him. Bah, 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 bah. He's like, you know what, bro? He says, you're, you're looking at things through your perspective. You got to start looking at it through God's perspective. And he said, get a job at Fields. He said, get a job, get a, get a coffee job. And I said, what? Get a coffee job? Man, I, I, I'm going to have a chance, man. I'm going to be on TV. Man, I'm, I'm going to be driving an Audi. I was like, man, what are you talking about? Get a coffee job. And he said, you know what? Get a coffee job. Trust God's plan. God calls you to follow him. Man, before you got this job, that was a coincidence. He's like, man, God's calling you to do something great for him. And I said, you know what? I, I, I submitted hard-heartedly to my leader <laughs> i said amen hey but the guy did by the grace of god that guy gave me 500 dollars for my trip to the glc in manila that year right now. Wow. But, uh, this was awesome. but i said hey you know what i, I hit him up we had another dinner i said yeah this isn't gonna work uh but this is awesome you know if you find the right guy for the job and uh, uh and I, I gave it up you know, and by the grace of God, that was in 2016. And here we are five years later. I'm married. Yeah. I'm really an incredible church. And God has blessed my life. And he's done so much more. So much more than he would have done if I would have just stayed in that one place right. with pg &E. wow. And what's so awesome is that summer at pg &E, I reached out to a mechanical engineer. A mechanical engineer who was an honor student at his college, a mechanical engineer who had dreams of working for NASA, a mechanical engineer who lived three hours out of town, and a mechanical engineer who I studied the Bible with and baptized. And he moved to San Francisco, commuting three hours twice a week to school in Merced, California. Wow. He graduated with honors. That's Ola Inca or adult. In the San Francisco church. Anyway, we were two of the only interns who didn't take full time jobs at PG &E. Dang. And now God's worked abundantly. And our lives, he has an awesome, he's dating an awesome sister who went to Columbia University and who just moved out here. She, she's, she's bilingual, trilingual. She's incredible, a lot better than he is. Uh, but God's blessed his life as well. And it's, but it's so awesome to see. Real life examples yeah. of, of God moving yeah. when we really surrender ourselves to Him. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't have a, a, I, I have a lot of flat sides. You know, there's a lot of areas where I'm not great. You know, uh, I have a lot of things that I know a lot of you guys have seen being over a year here that I do not do well. But one thing I can say that I can call you to imitate me in is to, to not think about what the world thinks of you. You know, uh, up until last week, for the last four years, I've been working coffee jobs. I've been waiting for the last year in Sacramento, I've woken up at 4 a.m. during the weekdays to go open to Starbucks at 4.30 in the morning. And man, my, my, my parents, my brothers, my friends, what are you doing? What are you doing? But here's the thing. I'm not doing it for them. That's right. That's right. I'm not doing it for, 
for the, the, the conversations at Thanksgiving. They say, hey, what do you do? Oh, I lead a church and I work at Starbucks. <laughs> I, I don't care what people say. Okay. I'm doing it for God. I'm, I, they God said, man, why do we give? Why do we give our hearts? Why do we give our money? We do it for this right here. Right. We do it for the family right here. Amen. Amen. Whatever you're struggling to let go of, whether that's man, whether that's just your time, what man, like, maybe it's just man, you you, you want to make disciples, but it just doesn't fit your schedule. Man, make the decision to sacrifice, sacrifice your man, sacrifice your Saturday. Off. Man, it's like why do I have time to share except Saturday? But Saturday is my off day. Amen. Sacrifice some time on Saturday. Wow. Man, sacrifice. It was so awesome. Yesterday I went to Old Sav. And I wish I would say, I could say it was just to share my faith, but it was getting a haircut. And, uh, but man, I was out there in Old Sack, and I reached out to this awesome guy who had a wife and two kids. He said, you know what, man, my wife and I have been looking for a church. I'd love to get together for a while. He said, please, I, I, we, we moved out here. We're looking for a church. Please, let's get together. And man, it, it, it's for that. It, it's to get out. Don't think about, man, what am I giving up, man? Think about what you're getting. Think about what you're giving in, the, the hope that you're giving to a lost world. You don't know what that next person you share with is going through right now. You don't know, know, know who that, that next person you run, run into at the grocery store, who that next person you help out at work, that next person you decide to make. You don't want to go share your faith, but you get out and you share your faith. You don't know what they're going through. But so that God can have a chance to move. I want to challenge us to grab on to God's con. Let go. This let go. Is it impurity in our life? Man, is it laziness? Maybe just a man, just to repent. It's a decision. If you're here this morning, you're in an awesome place. You're in a place where you have the opportunity to repent. Come on, bro. Yeah. And as you repent, you're going to get let go of those yokes holding you back. And if you haven't been feeling a, a joy and a freedom and a purpose, I mean, I also want to encourage you, hey, you're in a good place because, man, you have an opportunity to feel something you may have not felt in months, mm. in years. And there, there's not, nothing that's more, more refreshing than repentance. There's nothing more refreshing than repentance. And this, I just want to call you this week, whatever area there, that is that you just, it, it, you, you maybe at the beginning of the year you wanted to repent of, and you just sort of been putting it off. Maybe you said, I want to have quiet. I'm not going to miss a quiet time. And maybe that just went out the window after four days. You know, maybe, maybe it's, man, I want to pray every single morning for at least 30 minutes. Maybe it's, I want to share my faith every day. Maybe it's, man, I want to share my faith. With you. Whatever it is, I just want to call us to go after repentance. And let's close out here in John chapter 12. Come on, man. John chapter 12. On, bro. And in John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And this is as Jesus comes to the cross right before he goes to the cross, right after his prayer in the garden. And he says, you know what, God? This is why I was born. This is why I'm here. Father, glorify you. In the same way, the reason you were born spiritually was to glorify God's name. And just, I want to call you, call you. man, have an incredible prayer. Have an incredible quiet time tomorrow. And say, God, glorify your name through me. And just co commit yourself to the struggle. Commit yourself to the ministry. Commit yourself to changing your schedule for God. And, and when we make this decision to prioritize God,
prioritize the kingdom, prioritize lost souls. A lot of the struggles and the fights that we're going through right now are going to make their ways out of our lives. And on this Sunday morning, family, the Sunday after Easter, let us meditate on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross that we may connect with the sacrifice and be made alive in Christ. I love you guys. That's <laughs>